president has also received the following letter from Senator Scar. Uh, dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion, Labor's broken promises and woeful transparency as evidenced in Senate budget estimates hearings. I call on Senator Scar. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Is the proposal supported? <laughs> I now call on Senator Scar. <laughs> Sorry? Ah. Yeah, Senator Chandler knows her classic Kirk Douglas movies. Uh, I'm going um, to call us to order and Senator Scar. And, um, and Madam Acting Deputy President, you should uh, also read the book by Howard Fast, not just see the movie, which was uh, one of Stanley Kubrick's great movies. Now, uh, I rise to speak in relation to this matter of public importance, and it is a matter of great public importance, namely Labor's broken promises and woeful transparency, as evidenced in the Senate budget estimates hearings. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, I've got pages I could speak to, absolutely pages of this stuff, over, over 20, 21 pages of this. I was searching, I must say, uh, Senator Brown, I was searching for some reference, references to you in the pages, and I haven't. Um, I haven't uh, been able to find any, or perhaps I'm just too polite, and I've just uh, cast my eyes over them and moved to the next example. But let's go to uh, let's go to the first example I've got here in relation to uh, what happened at uh, estimates. And, and for those in the gallery, we should explain that estimates are an absolutely fundamental uh, process, fundamental to the role of this Senate chamber in terms of being a check and balance on executive power. It gives us the right to ask all senators, uh, including the crossbench, to ask questions in relation to any matter which involves government expenditure, and that's just about anything. So it is a very, very important uh, aspect of this uh, Senate chamber discharging its responsibilities as a chamber of review. First point, the defence budget cuts. Under questioning from Senator Birmingham, it was discovered in estimates that Labor has actually cut $1.5 billion from the defence budget. Now, one of the things those who have not seen estimates before um, should delight in on their first uh, interaction with the estimates process is those in the government will try and come up with every single synonym except cut. There might be reprofiling, there might be reallocation. It, there are all these words instead of a cut. But if there is less expenditure tomorrow on a program than there was today, that's a cut. And that's what's happening in defence—$1.5 billion cut from the defence budget. And not only, that, not only that, the questioning by my good friend Senator Birmingham revealed they're still looking for another $108 billion of cuts. So the poor Department of Defence not only has it had $1.5 billion cut from its budget, but it actually has to go out and find an additional $1.8 billion in savings. And that's in a high inflationary environment. That's in, in an environment where there are supply chain constraints and there is geopolitical uncertainty. The worst possible environment we should be expecting our Department of Defence to actually have to make these sorts of cuts. My second uh, example, and I actually sit on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Now, this is where this is a classic. This is a classic estimate scenario. The government announces something, and then they work out, "Gee, we're meant to go through a process before we announced it." So they go through the process after they've announced what they're actually intending to do. And this is in the context of the release of the Solicitor General's advice. So what happened in this context? The Solicitor General gave advice with respect to the voice. The Attorney General's Department's guidelines for briefing the Solicitor General note, opinions of a Solicitor General confidential, the Office of Legal Services Coordination and the Solicitor General's chambers must be consulted before any opinion of the Solicitor General or a former Solicitor General is provided to a personal body outside the Australian government. Must be consulted first. And what happened? The Prime Minister made an announcement, which was reported on the media at 2.31pm on 22 August, that the advice was going to be released, 
And when did the consultation occur? Well, the first time the Office of Legal Service Coordination heard about it was at 3.51 p.m. 3.51 p.m. So announcement, 2.31 p.m., but consultation in accordance with the process, good governance process, procedure, 3.51 p.m. Third example, and I've got pages of this stuff. It's like an episode of Utopia. I've got pages of it. Third, third example. I have to go through this one quickly and leave my colleagues to pick up the other examples. On Tuesday morning in the Economics Committee, Treasury Secretary Dr Stephen Kennedy confirmed under questioning from my good friend Senator Jane Hume that despite regularly briefing former Prime Ministers one-on-one -on -one about emerging economic issues, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Albanese, has not requested any briefing with the Treasury Secretary on inflation. Not one briefing on inflation. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, I'm rapt to actually get up and speak to this uh, matter of uh, public importance, and I thank my good friend Senator Scar, uh, who I have the highest of respect and regard for as one of the really intelligent, better operators on that side of the chamber. Um, but let's just walk through Senator Estabets and for my sins of a previous life. I think I'm up to about number 53, um, uh, 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 Senate. Uh, sorry, um, estimate rounds that I've been through, and I don't know what I did wrong to get 53, but anyway. And what we actually do, these Senate estimates, as Senator Scar said, is very important. It's the opportunity for the crossbench and for the opposition to you know, ask all the questions about the budget and get through, and we want them to do that. And I know when I've been in opposition, that's what we've wanted to do. And in my committee, I'm in the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. And uh, we have two portfolios, and ours is Regional Development Transport uh, infrastructure is one, and the other one was two days of agriculture. Two very, very important issues to this nation. And um, I want to hear senators ask questions. So what we do is, prior to Senate estimates, just so the gallery know and anyone listening, and I'm glad we're broadcasting, is the Senate standing committees, the legislation committees, meet you know, a month, six weeks out, and we ask senators which agencies and which parts of the department do you want. Who do you want to hear from? We don't try and hold back. We say, yes, just tell us who we'll have. And what we try to do is manage the time. So we set an agenda. Now, it's very fluid because there was a brainiacs in this joint thought they were so intelligent years ago when the motion was brought to just allow senators to just talk all day, question all day, ask the same tedious, repetitive questions all day with no respect to time limits which infuriates me because, you know, we see it. This is what happens. So we get a list of witnesses who come, and I am sick to death. I sit there and try and manage the program as the chair. When I say to my colleagues who I— my committee used to be one of the most collegiate committees in this building. Unfortunately, in the last uh, uh, this term round is one of the worst. And that's not a, that's not a scourge on members of the opposition. It's just the odd senator that comes in and disrupts. And we have people that travel from interstate because the Senate has informed them that they will be appearing at whatever time it may be on this day, give or take hopefully half an hour or whatever it may be. We got to this time, to this time, I got to the stage where I keep walking up to my colleagues and saying, we've got people from interstate, you've got them sitting here, are we going to get to them? Now, it's not my business, because unfortunately the brainy actually thought it was a great idea to let senators dribble crap on, oh sorry, I nearly, well, I'll withdraw that, dribble on all day about nothing to do with the budget. Can we at least tell those people from interstate, we are so sorry we have wasted your money, We've, we've got you to book airfares and get cars to get here and get accommodation or whatever it may be. And I don't mind if we don't get to them, as long as I can get to them first and say, look, I really do apologise, but the opposition still wants more time to ask the same damn questions that they've been asking for the last three hours. But this time round, not even the decency to give the witnesses the opportunity to say, we're not going to get to you. I tell you what I got, there was one agency in particular. I said these people were supposed to be on at 12, 12 o'clock or 12.30. It's now 4.30. Are we going to get to them? Because these three gentlemen from this RDC 
had to catch an aeroplane back to Narrabri, I think it was. So they'd come from Narrabri down to Sydney, down to Canberra the night before so they didn't get caught with the fog or anything because they wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to address all the senators' concerns about taxpayers' dollars being spent. No. You know what I got? I got one of the opposition senators who sat there, who's not even a full-time member of our committee, who sat there and said, well, we're here till 11 o'clock. So, so what? How rude was that? All they wanted to do was get a taxi out, get to the airport, and could they get the flight back to Sydney to catch their late night flight back to Narrabri? And the rudeness from that senator, who I've unfortunately had in this committee, in my committee, for the last three, two or three rounds of Senate estimates, couldn't even be decent enough to deal with people. So I'm really glad that my dear friend Senator Scar gave me the opportunity to raise this because it really irks me. And some on that side would say, you did it to us. Well, you know what? Not me. I always sat there as the deputy chair in opposition and said, we won't get to these people. I'll let you know so we can let them go. At least I had the Thank decency you, Senator, to do that. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Former Senator Rex Patrick said to me that transparency is a word that's only ever shouted from opposition benches. After years and years of virtue signalling from Labor while they were in opposition about the importance of transparency, of accountability, about the importance of Senate estimates hearings, now that they're in government, it's an entirely different story. Before they were elected to government, we heard endlessly from Labor that the government should be accountable, and one of the ways they should be held accountable is through orders for the production of documents. Labor has resisted voting. It, it resisted. It's voted against or refused to comply with almost every order for the production of documents on which this Senate has voted. That same attitude is prolific and has shown up again over two weeks of Senate estimates hearings. I've got plenty of criticisms to get into about the Labor Party, yet I've got to ask some of the senators from the Liberals. It's a little rich, don't you think? While you were in government, there were plenty of motions for production of documents and evasiveness at Senate estimates. When it comes to accountability and transparency of government information, unfortunately, the Liberal and Labor are two wings of the same bird. As former Senator Rex Patrick said so accurately, transparency is a word only shouted from the opposition benches. Once in government, it's all quiet. So let's have a look at just some of the transparency that Labor has blocked. Motion number 124, an order for the production of documents to tell the Australian people how much extra Prime Minister Anthony Albanese cost them to call Parliament back for a ridiculous one day of sitting to push his gas industry nationalisation through. It likely cost millions of dollars just so Labor could pull a stunt and claim they were doing something on electricity prices. Six months later, it's done nothing. Looking good, not doing good. What, that's what matters to Labor. What was Labor's response to the Senate ordering them to tell Australia how much this exercise had cost? They may as well have just put a middle finger in the envelope. Not one dollar in costings, such as the contempt they have for this Senate and for the Australian taxpayers. Let's look at motion number 176. In order to produce documents relating to millions of dollars being paid to political parties for ill-defined grants and programs. What was Labor's answer? Contempt. Not a single document related to the funding produced. Not a single document. What about motion number 200? Just yesterday, documents requested in relation to the MRH-90 helicopter crash in Jarvis Bay. Documents that would uncover if we are putting a defence personnel at risk of death flying in dodgy helicopters. The government refused to return a single document. Not a single document. Of course, this culture of secrecy extended to Senate estimates. We saw witnesses tell outright lies to the Senate and the Labor ministers sit by idly. Ministers raised flimsy public interest immunity claims, if they bothered to raise them at all. In this Foreign Affairs Defence and Trade hearings, Chief of Defence Force General, Ad General Campbell simply flatly refused to answer questions from myself and from Senator Shoebridge. That's not how Senate estimates works. If a witness does not want to answer a question, they are obliged to take it on notice, and then it is up to the minister to raise a claim of public interest immunity not the witness. General Campbell knew this. He's attended many estimate sessions. The Labor minister at the table knew this, yet sat there in silence as the witness treated questions with outright contempt. Again, 
Transparency is a word only shouted from the opposition benches. And now we've had a constituent, two constituents, one from Queensland and one from New South Wales, telling us about specific instances that indicate a senior member of one of the departments lied. So we're chasing that up now with question on notice following Senate estimates. Let's not forget the unanswered questions on notice. Answers to questions on notice were flowing in while the next Senate estimates had already started. Make no mistake, many of these answers were no doubt available, yet they probably sat on the minister's desk waiting for a final sign-off. That's why many of the questions on notice don't arrive in time. Ministers are holding them up. So much for transparency. There's no reason a minister needs to sign off on answers anyway. The truth is the truth. The, answer, the agency's answer is their evidence. It's their evidence. It's not for the minister to change. None of this will change until the Senate fulfills its duty to bring contempt charges against those who treat it with contempt. It's within our power to enforce accountability. A few contempt charges and a couple of witnesses in jail should send a message to the others. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Madam uh, Deputy Chair. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a bit off guard there. Yeah, look, we're talking about uh, broken promises. Uh, I want to first touch on the whole aged care issue, which I think is worth uh, noting. Uh, we were promised that there would be nurses 24-7 in aged care homes, I think, by June 30 this year. That hasn't happened. Uh, the Minister, Annika Wells, isn't prepared to actually state uh, when, uh, you know, or even give a figure, or even give a figure as to what, what the number of aged care centres that do have uh, full-time nurses. I, I'm personally not in favour of the policy in the sense that my view is if that someone is sick, they should go to hospital. I think it makes it very confusing uh, when you've got aged care centres acting as, as uh, nursing homes as well. I think there needs to be a clear delineation. I accept it's not an easy thing to solve, uh, but that was a promise that was made by Albanese, uh, sorry, the Labor government, the Prime Minister. Uh, Anthony Albanese and the Labor government, and it's a promise that I don't think they're serious about keeping. Uh, and you know, the least that they could do, yet again, as I spoke about this this morning, is at least give us a figure uh, as to how many nurses are, you know, full-time nurses are, nurses are in aged care centres on a full-time basis, 24 hours a day basis, uh, so that we can gauge the performance of the uh, Labor Albanese government. And. I think it's very disappointing that the, the uh, aged care minister, Annika Wells, won't answer that question. So that's, that's one thing that we could talk about in terms of broken promises and accountability. Uh, the other thing that I've found very annoying is the release of the uh, National Cabinet minutes. Uh, I, uh, uh, the Prime Minister again, the current Prime Minister again, when he was opposition leader, said that he would release the minutes of National Cabinet, and he you know, used that to uh, wedge the Morrison government. And, I myself was never a fan of National Cabinet, and I also thought the minutes should be released when uh, we are in government. So, you know, yet again, it's a case of saying one thing in opposition and another thing in government. And I think the Albanese, this is another example of where the Albanese government—it's not a hard thing to do. Uh, I'm sure these these meetings aren't that detailed, or it's that difficult to have a secretary in there to actually take the minutes. Yet they refuse to release the minutes. And wh why is this so hard? Why can't we have greater transparency? Uh, as to what goes on between the federal and state governments. I mean, federal, uh, the federal government pays billions of dollars a year in transfer payments to state governments, and I think we've got a right to know uh, how, how this money is distributed uh, and, and the, the reasons behind it and, and, and the wrangling. Of course, then we move to the cost of living issues, uh, and of course, we never saw power prices uh, decrease by $275. As a matter of fact, they're up by about $700. Uh, as at the last budget, and just last week, we see the retailers, energy retailers, saying that they're going to up uh, energy prices again, coming into the new financial year of between 28 to 30 per cent. That is enormous. That is enormous. And uh, you know, a another reckless statement, given that there is a massive energy transmission. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, transfer from you know reliable, cheaper baseload energy to renewables. Um, another broken promise or, or lack of transparency is I know when uh, uh, an earlier set of estimates I've asked the uh, Environment Minister or the, you know, the Acting Environment Minister, Senator McAllister, in estimates uh, just how many kilometres of transmission lines do we need to reach 82 per cent of renewables by 2030? And the department just couldn't even answer that question. They have no idea. 
uh, of how many kilometres of transmission lines uh, are needed for, uh, to reach 82 per cent of the grid. And I think it's absolutely absurd that you're going to legislate uh, to get to 43 per cent reduction in CO2 by 2030, and, and of which to reach that you've got to reduce uh, baseload energy or get, get renewable energy up to 82 per cent of the grid, and you can't actually say how many kilometres of transmission lines you need to do it. I mean, at least get you know some idea, have a plan. I mean, I can't even get a plan uh, out, of the, out, of, out of the Albanese government. Uh, and the last thing, and, and this isn't necessarily broken promise or transparency, but I will have a crack at the Prime Minister because he had a crack at me for moving a motion uh, to get the RAC committee to have a look into the regional banking inquiry. Uh, and you know, he, this bloke doesn't even know me. He doesn't know anything about my past or you know my passion for regional services, and he's he's dared me into uh, you know saying I won't do anything for regional banks. Well, let me tell you right here, right now, I'm going to be pushing for a, an old-fashioned public bank. Paul Keating sold the CBA. I want a new public bank. I want a, a state government insurance office or a federal government insurance office, and I want the Commonwealth government to offer interest-free bonds in lieu of superannuation. So I'll hold him to it. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I would genuinely like to thank uh, Senator Scar for the opportunity uh, to talk about transparency. Transparency, a word that no one would use to describe those opposite the previous government. Uh, and it is absolutely laughable that the opposition even thinks about bringing a motion into this chamber with the word transparency printed in it. Um, whether it was sports rorts or car park rorts, overpriced land rorts, overpriced water buybacks, hiding behind whiteboards, uh, manufacturing colour-coded spreadsheets, um, those opposite have absolutely zero authority to come into this chamber with a motion about transparency. Um, these are the people who had a Prime Minister who we all know now, now we know, secretly appointed himself uh, as Minister for Health, Minister for Finance, Minister for Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, Minister for Home Affairs, uh, and of course he appointed himself uh, as Treasurer as well, just to round it off. How is that for transparency? How's that on the transparency index of those opposite? And we are still uncovering the dodgy dealings, the dodgy dealings, the rorts, the cover-ups of the Liberals in government. Only this month did the National Audit Office find that the Morrison government deliberately breached federal grant rules in administering the $2 billion community health and hospitals program. And the audit found that the funds were used in a way that was failing ethical standards, failing ethical standards and also exceeding legal authority, using taxpayer dollars as if they were Liberal Party dollars yet again. Now, our government is still cleaning up the mess that has been left by those opposite. <laughs> After more than a year in government, we are in fact still answering questions that were placed on notice outstanding from the previous government. Uh, that is your record on accountability. That is your record on accountability to this chamber. Now, for our part, a total of 6,733 questions were asked on notice to this government, the current government, following the supplementary budget estimates hearings in February. Uh, and we have already answered all but 11 of those. That is 6,722 questions answered. Um, for those playing along at home, 99.8 per cent of questions answered. Um, and so I'm pretty happy to stake uh, my reputation and say that this is a much better compliance rate uh, than that achieved by the Morrison government ever. We are delivering a higher standard of integrity, a higher standard of transparency, a higher standard of accountability in government. We are upholding a standard that the opposition never even got close to, never even got into the room with, never even imagined getting close to. We are the government who has legislated a powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission. 
which will commence operation in July this year. Uh, and the former government's proposed integrity commission, um, everyone will remember, was so weak it wouldn't even have been able to commence its own independent inquiries, and it was never even introduced into the parliament. The model was described by legal experts as a body not designed to stamp out corruption, but to help cover it up. To help cover it up. Now, for the first time in a decade, Australia's ranking in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index has risen, lifting to 13th. And I reckon we can do better than that. Under the Liberals, Australia's rank fell 11 places, 11 places to 18th. The worst result of any OECD country and the worst result in our nation's history. Transparency International directly attributes Australia's dramatically improved ranking to our government's landmark National Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, and we are being accountable at Senate estimates as well. During the budget estimates referred to in Senator Scar's motion, question after question was asked and answered. Um, questions after our budget, a budget that is delivering for the Australian people and that was scrutinised um, in over 100 hours of questions across eight different committees. We are proud of our record of transparency Thank you, Senator. and we stand Your time's by expired. it. Senator Bragg. Yeah, thanks very much. And I welcome the opportunity to speak on this matter of public importance in relation to the um, transparency and the lack of transparency of this government. And uh, I think it's comical that this government thinks that it's being transparent, and I think it's acting like most governments act. And as uh, former Senator Patrick has said, that all governments engage in a level of uh, secrecy, uh, perhaps too much secrecy. And what we see on a daily basis is the frustration of freedom of information requests, the frustration of orders of production of documents and the frustration of proper answers to questions on notice. That is the basic situation, uh, that it is very hard to get information out of this government. Now, of course, the overall settings here uh, are that the government has engaged in a taxing and spending uh, situation which has required it to raise new taxes. Now, the consequence of the new taxes is that there is a process that departments have to go through where oppositions conduct their business of trying to get to the bottom of how these new taxes have been constructed, consulted on. Uh, I've often called this government the government for vested interests because its main focus is on the vested interests of its fellow travellers, class action law firms, the big super funds and the unions. Uh, and what you see is the ministers working through the laundry list of the things that are important to the unions and the super funds. We saw it yesterday with Minister Jones announcing a policy on financial advice. Minister Jones has prioritised the interests of super funds over the interests of people. And so the government worked through consultation processes, usually in secret, with their favourite vested interests. Usually the unions might be on patent bargaining or could be on stripping transparency from super funds. And they work through these processes in the dark. And then our job is to try and work out, well, OK, how did they draft this bill in this way? Who was in the room? Who provided advice? Whose business model does it suit? Because when you are the government for vested interests, everything is about grifting for your favourite vested interests that you work for. Now, in the case of the super issues, uh, we all know that uh, Minister Jones' first act as the minister was to strip transparency from the super funds so that people couldn't see how much of their money was being sent off to the unions. Now, the Senate, in its infinite wisdom, decided to uh, roll back that regulation. Uh, but more broadly, uh, the government has had to fill its fiscal holes with new taxes. So one of its new taxes is the franking policy. Of course, the Prime Minister promised there would be no changes to franking before the last election, and then in their very first budget in October announced that there would be two changes to franking, two changes, one on off-market buy buybacks, another one in relation to capital raisings. Now, the capital raisings one is very interesting because we asked a number of questions on notice and we pursued 
the Treasury Department to work out how this policy has been costed and modelled. And after an extensive process of uh, obfuscation, we found out that the modelling was from 2016, when there was some activity that the tax office was concerned about in relation to capital raisings and the issuance of frank dividends. And of course, today, according to the Treasury Department in 2023, uh, there are no nefarious activities happening in relation to capital raisings and the payment of frank dividends. But the modelling is from 2016 and is alleged to raise $10 million. So how could the modelling today be the same? Obviously, the modelling can't be right, but we only know this because we had to go through an extensive process of questions on notice, FOIs, uh, and order for production of documents, which I acknowledge the Greens' role in ensuring that orders for production of documents are approved and then information is provided. But it is very hard to get information about, out, out about how policies have been developed, who has been involved in developing them, which vested interest, and how it's been modelled. So these are central questions that face all oppositions. And I would say in this first year of opposition, it's been a very difficult effort, but we remain committed to holding this government to account. And I believe that it is now time to report that my time has expired. And I shall sit down now.